11 of On Writing Well by William Zinsser. And we're going to start with chapter 8, which is about unity. So when we think about unity, the first thing we start with um, are pronouns. We want to have the same unity throughout. Are we going to write in first person so as a participant? Are we going to write in third person? Those are the two common ways. Which way are we going to do it? We need to keep that uh, unity throughout the story, throughout what we write. Uh, there may be differences in different places where we might use different ones, but we've got to have unity in there. The next thing is the unity of tense. Are we going to be past tense or are we going to be present tense? Uh, mostly we're going to be past tense. We don't want to mix those up in our, in our writing. We want to keep a, a very unity of tense for the most part. There are can be exceptions, of course. Uh, when you're doing your memoirs, you may want to open with a narrative and be very present tense for us to, to feel like we're there. And at some point, you might switch to a past tense when we're leaving that narrative to talk about that experience, possibly, in a, in a, in a past tense sort of way. Um, but in something like that, you might be able to get away with writing in a, in a present tense all the way through. Uh, the other thing we want to talk about is unity of mood. We want to have a casual voice, we want to be formal, whichever one we are, we want it to really stay the same throughout. We don't want to be jumping around, being starting out very casual, going very formal, and then kind of coming back to very casual. You might see this in travel pieces, in, in, in travel writing, in restaurant reviews, where the person is sort of giving their narrative of what it's like, and then they go into this real formal tone of what they think they're supposed to sound like as a critic. So keep that mood throughout. Don't try not to change that. Um, there are mood switches and changes in, in certain things, um, but you want to keep this overall sense the same throughout. Okay, so you might have it as a happy, a serious, it's your choice and whatever fits the writing, but you want to keep it pretty much the same as you go through. Uh, now we're going to move on to chapter 9. We're going to talk about the lead and the ending. Uh, the lead uh, is really the most important part of anything you write. Uh, that's borrowed from journalism, talking about leads. Uh, the first sentence or the first paragraph or two of a story is what we consider the lead. Um, so we have to uh, consider that. The most important sentence in any article is the first one. That's the first sentence of the chapter that Zinzer writes. Um, he gives a good example of a piece, um, I think, that he wrote about um, hot dogs at one time. I've often wondered what goes into a hot dog. Now I, went, now I know and wish I didn't. That makes you want to read on and say, well, what is in a hot dog? And wants to give you that, that sense of uh, it gives you that sense of that you want to keep reading and that's what you want to do with the beginning of a story. So let's talk now about the ending. The lead as we know is the most important sentence in what you write. That first sentence is key. The lead not as important, I mean the ending, excuse me. We can't say it's as important but it almost is. Um, you should give a lot of thought to how you write your last sentence uh, almost as much as the first. So, most of us, we're still, as Zinzer says, prisoners of that lesson that's been pounded into us uh, since we started writing compositions uh, in, in grade school. So, we, we feel that way and we feel compelled to do that, but I don't want you to do that. Um, when you start writing something like, in some it can be noted that, or what insights then have we been able to glean from. Those are signals that you're starting to wrap to do this summary and tell me things you've already said in detail. So you've already given me this stuff in detail. Now you're going to wrap it up in this summary and readers, they quit. The, their, their interest really, really starts waning at that point. Um, a positive reason for an ending, for ending well, is that a good last sentence or a good last paragraph you know, for you as a writer, it's, it can be a joy in itself. Uh, that's what Zinzer says, and I agree with that. I, I've felt that before when I write. Uh, it, it, it gives the reader a lift, um, and it, it, kind of it can linger when the article is over. 
Um, the perfect ending, it can feel abrupt. Um, it can feel like maybe we ended too soon. But if you take your readers a little bit by surprise, but yet seem exactly right, that's what you're aiming for. It takes them a little by surprise, yet feels exactly right. Um, and the more you write, the better you get at those kinds of things. And this will be something you're going to try to do in your memoirs. Um, and, and still even some of the other writing we do, but definitely in those. Uh, if we move on here, think about other things that that end can do. Um, is sort of that full circle thing. Um, you sort of strike, uh, there's sort of an echo at the end that uh, goes back to the beginning. And, and when you can do that without summarizing, but still find me tying that in back to the beginning is a, is a very effective way to finish a story and finish any piece of writing. Uh, quotations work really well in journalism, news writing, um, so if you're, you write your memoirs, if you're recreating some quotes, some scenes with some quotes and so forth, that might be something you try to do. Uh, but uh, for most of what you're going to be doing, you're not going to be doing some quotations. But if, you ever, if you're writing in those types of things, that is effective. So now we're going to move on to uh, Chapter 10, talk about bits and pieces. There's a lot of good stuff in this chapter. First, we're going to look at uh, active verbs. Uh, they just really move things forward. Uh, they, they liven up writing. Um, uh, use them unless there's no comfortable way to get around using a passive verb. Um, the example in the book is Joe saw him. That's strong. Joe saw him. That's a strong way to say it. It's weak to say he was seen by Joe. We want, we want our nouns doing the action so we have Joe saw him. That's, that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Um, uh, don't say the president of the company stepped down. Okay, did he resign? Did he retire? Did he get fired? Be precise and use precise verbs as well. Step down is ambiguous, so avoid ambiguity. Um, and also, um, shorter words are good as well um, in those situations. Um, he was let go. Say he was fired. It's a better shorter way, more precise way to do it. Um, adverbs. Uh, there's sort of those weak links in the chain. Um, the redundant ones really weak in verbs. Most of them really clutter up. You want to uh, find the better verb instead of needing an adverb to go with the verb or realize that you're being redundant. Um, one example in the book is totally, flab totally flabbergasted. Hard to say. So the as he says, the beauty of the word flabbergasted is it implies something, an astonishment that is total. So if I'm flabbergasted, I am total. I'm totally flabbergasted. There's no real degree of being flabbergasted. So think about if you're putting things in degrees and using words like vary a lot, you don't. You want to avoid that. Uh, adjectives uh, is the concept really or already in the noun. So be careful of that. Uh, look at your adjectives, and if the noun itself means that, then you don't need the adjective. I can, I can, I can remember uh, uh, having uh, a piece of a story come across my desk one time, and a writer referred to a, a small town as a tiny hamlet. Well, if you look up the word hamlet uh, in re reference to a town, it it is tiny. It'd be like saying a tiny village. Villages are small and tiny. They are not big. So in that case, don't use that adjective. It really adds nothing. It just clutters. Um, and make them do the work that needs to be done. Don't use adjectives that um, really add nothing. Make sure they're doing some work that adds to the sentence and doesn't repeat or be redundant. Um, one thing we think about with adjectives and adverbs is we don't want to use in things to intensify something. If you feel a need to intensify the meaning of the noun, there's probably a better noun that you can find instead of having to intensify it. Uh, little qualifiers, things that you see the ones across the bottom of the screen, those uh, you want to cut those out like, like dead wood. Uh, they don't help. They weaken what you're trying to say. 
if you feel like you've got to say very or quite or kind of because that's what you really mean well then maybe the what follows kind of or rather or quite or very isn't strong enough you need a better word so you don't have to do that most of the time you're, you're hedging a little bit don't hedge just say what you want to say um, be be committed to what you want to say punctuation uh, periods are good shorter the sentences the better most of the time varying sentences sentence lengths don't be afraid to put a period somewhere and start a new sentence uh, exclamation points save those for interjections don't it, avoid exclamation points you you don't really need them um, you don't need to put the one at the end of a sentence to emphasize it it doesn't help write a good sentence that doesn't need that that's what you want to try to do uh, semicolons dashes and colons uh, do a lot of the same work I like the long dashes I didn't used to but I like them more than I used to um, semicolons not a big fan of all the time and uh, colons work when followed by a series a lot of times that that's when they work the best mood changers um, they really help us uh, help readers along uh, words like but yet however nevertheless instead therefore meanwhile now later words like that help us help a reader understand there's a little bit of a mood change here there's a little, something is changing we're going we said this but then it's this or however oh, but nevertheless um, those types of things um, work and help the reader move along that's why I said don't be afraid to start a sentence with 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 but or uh, yet or therefore it's it's okay uh, I think it helps readers along and that's what you're trying to do you want them to stick with you contractions trust your ear and your instincts uh, I'll won't can't those are all perfectly acceptable uh, that's how we talk we want to be conversational uh, things like heed, weed, I'd, be careful of those because they can mean, you know, I'd can mean I had or I would. So it's better not to use contractions in those senses just to be to be very precise. Uh, that and which, use that unless the meaning is ambiguous. That's the most common way to think about it, but uh, there's a section in here, 74 and 75 in the book, that really explains that very well. I won't go into it here, but you should be familiar with that you get in a situation where you're not sure which to use refer to that in this book and it will it will straighten you out and you'll know how to do it concept nouns you want people doing things you want to stay away from concepts so some examples in the book and I'll, and I'll do one here um, a concept noun here of uh, the common reaction is incredulous laughter okay so laughter is sort of our concept here um, why don't we just say most people just laugh with disbelief have people doing things uh, it's a lot better it's a lot more effective and it's more it just makes more sense it's easier to understand uh, creeping nounism find a noun or better yet a verb um, watch out for things that uh, we're turning words into nouns that really aren't really aren't nouns uh, there's a good little couple paragraphs about that on page 76. So uh, read that and, and get a good understanding of that. Uh, overstatement, uh, hyperbole, these types of things. Um, uh, be you know don't uh, be careful of that. You can do some things for effect. Metaphors are, are a different thing. Overstatement is is when we uh, say things like. Uh, uh, in, the, in the book it says the living room looked as if an atomic bomb had got off there writes the novice writer well that is a nov a, a not a good way to say it um, it didn't really happen that way um, uh, it's exaggerating and makes a point but it's not really a good w way to do it um, maybe there's, there's there's a better way to describe the scene describe the scene in detail tell us what it looked like help us let us think that maybe it was like a bomb went off, but don't tell us that that happened because that really is not very descriptive. Uh, credibility, you want to be credible uh, in everything you say. Don't inflate something. Don't be too outlandish, and that gets back to overstatement. Um, that you're trying to pass off anything as true. Um, if you do that, everything you write will be suspect. So don't take those risks. Um, make sure you're 
you're credible in what you say. Um, it's not a contest. Um, you're writing uh, in a contest with yourself. Um, don't you're gonna see what some other people write in this class and so forth. Um, you're not trying to compete against them. You're trying to get better at what you do, and that's 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 what your contest is at this point. Um, the quickest fix sometimes is the delete key, and we talked about revision. Uh, that there should be joy in the revision and making it better than joy in the first draft. Don't take a lot of joy in that first draft. Take it in the revision that you make it better. Maybe that'll help those of you who feel like you're cutting off an arm when I make you cut something in half, or you're just killing off all this wonderful stuff that you want, taking a, taking a part of your soul out of there. You're not really doing that. You're just making it better. So take more joy in the final product than that first draft. Paragraphs, keep them short. A lot of you had longer paragraphs in the first assignment, so work at keeping them short. It helps readers move through things more quickly. And then and the last thing, uh, tip, is about in regards to sexism. Um, a lot of times we get in a, position, a situation where we want to say he or she. Well, make things plural. Um, do things, rewrite it so that you can say they things like that so you don't have to say he or she or actually write whether he or she would do this um, or a him or her uh, those types of things because it's kind of awkward and doesn't we don't really talk like that um, so just just try to be uh, uh, conscious of that and 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 work at using uh, phrasing so that you can you can pluralize your pronoun and that's what you want to try to do and that will solve that problem for you Okay, well, that's all we have for chapters 8 and 11 on writing well, and uh, thanks for your attention.